All right, everybody, I'm back. So uh, I answered your uh, excellent questions, and I just want to dig into the book uh, a little bit here, and then we'll do a little wrap up, and then The Great Gatsby will be a part of you forever. So I'm going to jump through. I'm just going to kind of hit spots that I think are very important. We're not going to get into every detail. I could spend the rest of your life uh, talking about this book because it's a great book and I know it well. But I'm not going to do that to you. Here's the first time Nick and Gadsby meet. He smiled understandingly, much more than understandingly. It was one of those rare smiles with the quality of eternal reassurance in it that you may come across four or five times in life. Now that's nice, right? Eternal, you feel reassured in Gadsby's presence. That's good. It faced or seemed to face the whole external world for an instant and then concentrated on you with an irresistible prejudice in your favor. It understood you just so far as you wanted to be understood. Believed in you as you would like to believe in yourself and assured you that it had precisely the impression of you that at your best you hoped to convey. Now that is very charming. That would be great for someone in sales. Um, but it's not sincere, right? Gadsby is like a mirror that you look into and you look exactly how you want to look. You have a full head of hair, no gray in your beard. Um, that's not real though, right? I'm losing my hair and I have gray in my beard. So Gadsby is not reflecting reality back at you. Gadsby is reflecting back at you how you think of yourself at your absolute best. That's not genuine, right? That's not someone you have a real relationship with. Um, so as beautiful and charming as that is, it shows that Gatsby uh, is two dimensional, um, a two dimensional person. Um, next up, Nick thinks Gatsby is pretty wacky, honestly, um, for the first few chapters of this book. He's like, who is this guy holding his arms out into the night, takes, takes me to lunch with a gangster, Meyer Wolfsheim. But then Nick finds out that Gadsby's reason for living is Daisy. And when Jordan asks Nick if Nick's house can be the place where Daisy and Gadsby reunite, and Nick says, ah, oh, then it had not been merely the stars to which he had aspired on that June night. He came alive to me, delivered suddenly from the womb of his purposeless splendor. Now folks, Forget about the book for a minute. That's beautiful writing. One of the reasons all of the movie versions of this book have kind of been failures is that they just, once you lose the descriptive language like that and you just show it on a screen, it doesn't, it doesn't lose the magic. He came alive to me, delivered suddenly from the womb of his purposeless splendor. Up to that point, Nick thought Gadsby was just another rich person showing off. That's the moment when he realizes it's all for Daisy. The shirts, the car, the house, the money, everything is for Daisy. Which is very unhealthy, but there is something sort of beautiful and romantic about it. That is when Gadsby is delivered from the womb of his purposeless splendor. The splendor of Gadsby suddenly has a purpose, and that is to get Daisy. So Nick does set up a meeting, a reuniting moment with Daisy and Gadsby. And uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it doesn't go great. Uh, it's at Nick's house and uh, Gadsby's extremely awkward uh, at the beginning of this meeting. And since I happen to have my mantle behind me, um, I can probably act it out for you. So they meet uh, at Nick's. And Gadsby, his hands still in his pockets, was reclining against the mantelpiece in a strained counterfeit of ease. <laughs> He's trying to look cool, but he is really nervous, right? Five years have been building up to this moment. He leaned back so far 
that it rested against the face of a defunct, a broken mantelpiece clock. And from that position, his distraught eyes stared down at Daisy, who was sitting frightened but graceful on the edge of a chair. Now, Gadsby, you would think he's had five years to come up with a line, right? Five years to come up with something to say to Daisy after not seeing her for five years. This is his line. We've met before. Really, Gadsby? We've met before, muttered Gadsby. His eyes glanced momentarily at me. His lips parted with an abortive attempt at a laugh. Luckily, the clock took this moment to tilt dangerously at the pressure of his head, whereupon he turned and caught it with trembling fingers and let it back down in place. Now, great symbolism there, right? Gadsby holding a broken clock. For Gadsby, time stopped five years ago um, when the last time he saw Daisy. And this is the moment where time is going to pick up again uh, for Gadsby. But instead, we have this image of Gadsby with a broken clock. And Gadsby is stuck in time. He is as useless as a broken clock. So they reunite, things do finally open up. Uh, they talk and it becomes more comfortable. And then of course Gadsby's goal is to get Daisy over to his house so she can see that he's rich. And she'll say, oh, you're rich, I love you, I'll be with you now. Uh, very naive, of course, on Gadsby's part. Uh, Daisy's never gonna leave Tom because they're meant for each other. They're both from money. Gadsby has money. He's not from money. So this, so they reunite, they go over to Gatsby's house. Nick is leaving the two lovebirds, reunited alone, and this is what he says. There must have been moments, even that afternoon, when Daisy tumbled short of his dreams. Not through her own fault, but because of the colossal vitality of his illusion. Why did Daisy fall short of Gatsby's eyes that afternoon? Because he'd spent five years. He'd thrown himself into it with a creative passion, adding to it all the time, decking it out with every bright feather that drifted his way. So you've got to realize here that he's been hyping her up for five years. Um, and if things are overhyped, guess what? They're never gonna live up to it. Daisy has no chance of satisfying Gadsby's dream that afternoon or ever because he's created something that doesn't exist, an idealized Daisy. <sighs> you ever have a friend say to you, you've got to see this movie. This movie is amazing. It'll change your life. And you go to the movie and it's like, yeah, right? Expectations were too high. Well, I'm telling you here today, folks, I'm the only teacher who's ever going to tell you this, but Mr. Berninger keeps it straight. Keep your expectations in life very low, work hard, and you'll always be satisfied. Gatsby expects too much. Keep your expectations in life low, work hard, and you'll always be satisfied. Don't dream. Work hard. Work hard. Remember that. Remember who told you that, people. Moving on. Um... <laughs> All right, the climactic scene of the book. Chapter seven, um, Daisy, Gadsby, Tom, Jordan, Nick, they're all hanging out at the Buchanan house. And um, they decide, well, they're bored, right? They're bored. They're gonna drive into the city, drink in some hotel suite, okay? Um, so they get in the cars, now this is important, uh, they switch cars. Nick gets into Gadsby's yellow car with Tom and Jordan, and Daisy slips into Tom's car with Gadsby. So they've switched cars at this point. They drive into the city. At the gas station, Myrtle actually sees Tom in the yellow car. When they leave the city, Daisy's driving the yellow car with Gatsby. Myrtle runs out thinking it's Tom and boom, 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 she gets hit. All right. But anyway, here's the climactic moment of the, of, the, of the novel in the hotel room with the five of them. Wait a minute, snapped Tom. I want to ask Mr. Gatsby one more question. What kind of row problem? 
What kind of row are you trying to cause in my house anyhow? Earlier that day, Tom saw Daisy and Gatsby's eyes meet and Daisy said to Gatsby, you look so cool. You always look so, so cool. And that dim little light bulb went on over Tom's head and he knew they were having an affair. Daisy's the smartest one of the bunch. He isn't causing a row, Daisy looked desperately from one to the other. You're causing a row. Please have a little self-control. Self-control, repeated Tom incredulously. I suppose the latest thing is to sit back and let Mr. Nobody from nowhere make love to your wife. Of course, Tom screws anything that moves. Well, if that's the idea, you can count me out. Nowadays, people begin by sneering at family life and family institutions, and next thing you know, they'll throw everything overboard and have intermarriage between black and white. Of course, Tom's a racist throughout the book. Um, flushed with impassioned gibberish, blah, blah, blah. So they, this is Tom has pushed the moment. Gatsby's happy about this. That's a good, I wanna know what Mr. Gatsby has to tell me, Tom says. Your wife doesn't love you, said Gatsby. She's never loved you. She loves me. Nah, 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 nah. Very childish, right? At this point, I just want to grab Gatsby by his pink coat and drag him out to the car. Your wife doesn't love you. She's lo never loved you. She loves me. You must be crazy, exclaimed Tom automatically. She's never loved you. Do you hear? She only married you because I was poor. She was tired of waiting for me. It was a terrible mistake, but in her heart, she never loved anyone except for me. Not good. At that point, Jordan and I tried to go, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Sit down, Daisy. Okay. Skipping ahead. From the ballroom beneath, the muffled and suffocating cords were drifting up on hot waves of air. There's a wedding going on, a wedding reception in the ballroom. And of course, Tom and Daisy are married. Gadsby and Daisy are not. Please don't, her voice said. She, Daisy, looked at Gatsby. There, Jay, she said, but her hand, as she tried to light a cigarette, was trembling. Suddenly, she threw the cigarette and burning match on the carpet. Oh, you want too much, she cried to Gatsby. This is it. This is the moment. Oh, you want too much, she cried to Gatsby. I love you now. Isn't that enough? I can't help what's past, she began to sob helplessly. I did love him once, but I loved you too. <laughs> Gatsby's eyes opened and closed, symbolically, opened to reality and closed. This is really the moment of Gatsby's symbolic death. Daisy says, I did love him once, but I loved you too. You loved me too, he repeated. Even that's a lie. She didn't know. Tom's the biggest jerk, one of the biggest jerks in American literature. He wins. At the end of this book, he has all his money, he has Daisy, the two of them are heading off to some other city where they will live like uh, royalty and do bad things to people and keep moving around, etc., etc. Tom wins because Tom has reality on his side. Um, a dreamer like Gatsby, who lives in illusion, has no hope when arguing with Tom. You loved me too? Now, realistically, people, you can love a lot of people, preferably not more than one at once, but, you know, come on. Um, yeah, Myrtle gets hit. Yeah, yeah, it's all very sad um, from here on out. Okay. The end of the book. So, Tom and uh, Daisy retreat into their money. Gadsby's dead, Myrtle's dead, the true dreamers in the book dead, right? The American dream is dead in this book. And uh, at the end, Nick goes over to this empty house, this sad, empty house, and he thinks about Gatsby. And that's where he really gives the book sort of this elevation. Uh, Fitzgerald writes in such a beautiful way um, about all the big shore places being closed. And Nick starts thinking about as we mentioned before, Nick starts thinking about the Dutch sailors, the first Europeans to sail into up the Hudson River, and how the 
Long Island flowered like a fresh green breast of the new world, the promise of the American dream. And of course the Dutch came here for money, not religious freedom or any principle for money. And that was it. And after that, America became a corrupt place where we people worship royalty and rich riches, just like in Europe, just like in Europe. Um, so it's a dark book and I kind of encourage you to reject it. I encourage you to reject the idea that you shouldn't be uh, an American dreamer. But I want you to see what Fitzgerald's telling us, that this American dream is terrible. Rich people are awful. I don't know, you know, rich people are fine, poor people are fine, there are jerks everywhere who have money, don't have money. But he's saying, this is what you want to become? The chasing of money and status is a false god. Um, you should be chasing peace and love and relationships. Um, connections with people, uh, not money and mistresses and bootlegging and thinking that after five years, a woman is just going to say, oh, you have money? Now I love you. I will be with you. Gadsby, you can't erase five years like Nikki erases a dirty word on Gadsby's porch at the end of the book.